All right, so in the last lecture earlier today, we learned a little bit about what a vector autoregression model was, um, what like the dynamic relationship was, and how we could get an impulse response function that meant something out of it. Now, in that last lecture, really all that you need to know is how to interpret the impulse response functions. The other stuff is important to know how we're getting the impulse response function, so you don't just, you know, you're not just learning these little curves in a vacuum, but I'm not going to be like testing you on, you know, how, how to derive the, the structural form of a demand and supply. I'm not going to do that. It's that. That's just way beyond what I would ever want you guys to do. Um, but in this lecture, this is where we're going to be tying together what we learned about in the real business cycle model, namely the responses to the shocks in the real business cycle model, and the impulse response stuff that we learned in the last lecture. So we learned how the real business cycle model should be responding to shocks. And there were four shocks that we looked at. There's technology, labor supply, government spending, and monetary policy shock. Now we saw how it responded in a static framework. The actual models, like with the actual real business cycle model, what would happen is it'd be solved out in a computer and we'd let it generate data from imposing stochastic shocks to the equilibrium. I'm not going to make you guys do that. Um, maybe if I get a little bit of time, I'll do it myself, and I'll show you guys what it would look like. It really wouldn't look that different from what we saw with the empirical stuff in the last lecture with the impulse responses. Um, a little different, but the idea would be about the same. Um, but really what I'm more worried about now is the empirical stuff. What does it look like using real-world data. Now, when we do that, if we're using real world data, we're looking at a dynamic framework and you're like, but you know that we looked at the static responses to these shocks. We did. However, even from the static responses to the shocks, that can still give us an idea as to what the directional responses of the dynamic shocks are. So it can still tell us if the model's any good. Do the results match? Now, what I'm going to be concerned about here is the signs of the responses. The magnitudes, well, it's that's getting kind of weird, murky territory, especially since we're looking at the static responses based on these curves. They're not really coming, like, being derived from exactly the same places, so it's like an apples and oranges comparison in terms of how much they're moving. But are they moving in the same direction? That's definitely something that we can ask ourselves today. And it's definitely something that I will be able to answer for you today, and that after today, you'll be able to answer. So by using these models, right, these theoretical models, yes, they give us predicted results, but I need real data. I need real data to be able to understand if the model's working. Because a model just in and of itself, with no empirical background, no empirical um, support, it's a useless model. Right? We want a model that can give us meaningful results in the real world. So this is where we're going to go over to a structural VAR model. And this is going to let us put that real world data into a structural model that looks kind of like the general equilibrium from the real business cycle model. Now, the general equilibrium from the real business cycle model, the reason I taught you all of these equations is because there's going to be like a real, like, structural um, representation of these. And it's also going to be telling us really what variables I'm probably going to want to be looking at. So this was the equilibrium for the real business cycle model. Now, this is not the like log linearized equilibrium. We would actually need to do one more step to really be able to understand what it's doing. I'm not going to make you guys do that because, well, it's just kind of taking things a bit too far for you. Um, but it would really be like a, uh, a Taylor series approximation around like a non-stochastic steady state, and then we'd impose shocks from there. And that's how we'd get impulse responses for the theoretical model. And then based on the specifications of those log linearized equations, we could then take that to a structural vector autoregression model. So it's not like a one-to-one -one like, I guess, mapping between these two different models. There's a little bit of, there's a, there's a little bit of a difference here. But 
we can at least get an idea as to like what we're looking at and what the general form might be, things like that. So what are these equations? Well, that first one, equation one, is a production function, right? We can think of that as like being able to give me perhaps aggregate supply or something like that. Now, in and of itself, the way it is here, not necessarily because, well, there's no price level, but bear with me. What's the second one going to be giving me? Well, think of that as like, I don't know, maybe demand. We could have consumption, investment, labor supply, labor demand, factor prices, bonds, something like that. So we're getting a general idea as to how we can fit real world data to a theoretical model. So what data are we going to use? Well, data is all going to come from the Federal Reserve Economic Database, the FRED. It's awesome. Um, that supplied a vast chunk of the data that I used in my dissertation research. Um, and I went and I got the data for you. I'm not going to make you run this stuff because well, there's a lot of code. Um, you got to use R. I think some of the packages I'm even using in R to run it like aren't even supported anymore. It's just it's, it'd be a real pain. But I'm using quarterly data from the fourth quarter of 2008 to the fourth quarter of 2019. I selected this data because, as we'll learn about after the financial crisis, this is like an unconventional monetary policy regime. So that's kind of like the 2008, like, left end bookend of this. The right side bookend, well, COVID-19. I wanted to avoid the data from that because that would also be contaminating this because... When you're selecting data in time series analysis, for any of you that move on to actually do any time series research, um, you want to make sure you're selecting data that's relevant to what you're looking at. If you've got, say, two different monetary policy regimes, and you're like, well, I wonder what monetary policy responses are going to be, well, you need to make sure that it's not being contaminated. You don't want two different regimes because, well, you've got a regime shift in there. You either need to control for that, which I didn't really feel like doing, or um, you can just go, I'm only looking at one regime. So the time periods that you choose are extremely important when it comes to this stuff. Um, so I don't want to assume the prior regime is the same as the regime after. And doing so, well, I kind of landed between 2008 and 2019 for the available data. So how do I translate this into a model that I can estimate using real-world data? Well, I go out and I gather time series on different variables. And what are the variables? Finally, getting to the variables, I've got output or GDP, uh, the personal consumption expenditures price index. That's the price index that's used by the Federal Reserve when they're trying to monitor inflation. I've got consumption, investment, hours worked, wages, a real interest rate, and then reserve balances. And the reserve balances, well, it's the component of the money base that the Federal Reserve directly controls. So let's look at what happens in response to these shocks in the real business cycle model. Now, this is kind of just going back to what happens in the theoretical model. These are the theoretical, like, let's draw out the little curves and see how they move. Total factor productivity or technology shock, right? This originates in the production function. Outputs can make more stuff because they can produce things more efficiently. And they're going to want more labor, so a technology shock triggers a labor demand shock. Because we have that labor demand shock, well, there's more labor now going into the production function. With more labor, well, you get to make more stuff. So you get more stuff from technology plus more workers in there. So output is going to be increasing. It increases like a lot. Prices fall. Hours worked and the wages increase because, well, there is an increase in labor demand. And the real interest rate falls. Now, the real interest rate drop here isn't going to be shown, but just remember in the ISLM stuff um, that you're not going to have to draw right now, um, it would be consistent with a supply shock. So, boom. This is a technology shock under the real business cycle model. So you get that shift in the production function, right? So this goes up, labor demand increases, and then we move over and up to a shift in the aggregate supply curve. Prices fall, output goes up. All right, let's look at a labor supply shock now. What happens in a labor supply shock? Well, 
This is like an increase in the population holding the reserve wage constant, or say a reduction in the reserve wage holding the size of the labor force constant. Either way, it implies a shock to the labor supply. So labor supply shifts out, more people are working more hours, so hours worked will increase, the wage rate drops. There's no change to technology, so there's no shift in the production function. We move to a new point on the existing production function, and there's a shift in aggregate supply. It's by a smaller amount than total factor productivity, but there is a shift in aggregate supply, and it's consistent with that diminishing marginal product of labor. So the more labor you add, yeah, you'll always get more production, more output, but it becomes less productive. What does this look like? Well, it looks like this right here. Labor supply shifts out. There's no shift in technology, so there's no change in this production curve, right? This doesn't move anywhere. So we just move to a new point on the same curve, over, up, boom. Aggregate supply shifts out. It doesn't shift out as much as it does from a total factor productivity shock, but it does shift out. Oh, here we go. Oops. Okay, it does shift out. Government spending. What is the government spending shock? Well, let's say the government wants to spend more money. They want to do it to influence the business cycle. So they either spend more by taxing or by borrowing. Consumers have less income to play around with, or investors have fewer loanable funds to play around with. It's likely a combination of the two. If it's more taxation, well, consumers have less disposable income. If it's borrowing, investors have fewer loanable funds, and that will eventually mean fewer um, or less disposable income for consumers in the future. So either way, you kind of get screwed. The private sector, either way, has fewer units of output at their disposal. So it's going to cause a shift in that IS curve. The real interest rate will increase. Aggregate demand shifts out. No change in technology because the government isn't anywhere in the production function at all. Um, and they're not really considered in the literature to drive any innovation in the production process. Uh, nothing against the, well, actually I got a lot against the government, but um, in this sense, particularly, you know, the, the model, uh, nothing against the government. Um, and I don't know, maybe a decent counterexample is like a wartime case, um, like, you know, World War II or something, but um, the government would either have to incentivize or mandate changes in production, which then alters resource allocation and isn't truly considered to be like an exogenous shock to production. Anyways, okay, so government spending shock. Now, remember, I got the ISLM stuff above this aggregate demand, aggregate supply, and it's not drawn here. Um, so just kind of remember what's going on, right? Well, the the, the IS curve is shifting out, moves aggregate demand out, and then the LM curve moves to adjust the price level. And we end up with this in this four graph system. The only thing that really moves is aggregate demand because we have a vertical aggregate supply. Prices respond instantaneously. There's no change in supply whatsoever. So under a government spending shock, well, the interest rate goes up and the price level goes up, and that's really about it. Finally, monetary policy. What happens here? Let's say the central bank wants to increase the money supply to influence the business cycle. Well, we'd have a shock to the LM curve, which initially lowers the real interest rate, and aggregate demand shifts out. Prices have to increase in order for that to happen, so the LM curve shifts all the way back in, and the real interest rate increases back to where it was. So the nominal interest rate declines, but the price level increases by the amount that the nominal interest rate declines, so the real interest rate remains unchanged. Prices are flexible, money's neutral, therefore there's no change to output at all because all prices adjusted, implying that output didn't have to. So monetary policy shock in the four graph system doesn't look any different than a government spending shock. But if you were to look at money and interest rates, well, things move around a little bit differently. The money supply will be increasing under a monetary policy shock, and the interest rate's going to fall, at least initially, and then it'll kind of go back up. The nominal interest rate falls. Under a government spending shock, well, the interest rate's going to be increasing. So you can identify the difference between the two, just not necessarily in this four-graph system. And if we were to summarize the shocks that we are going to be looking at, well, these four right here... We've looked at, we, we're probably just going to leave this expected inflation shock alone for now, but 
technology, labor supply, government spending, monetary policy. These, we can sum up their qualitative responses with zero, plus, or minus. Plus if it goes up, minus if it goes down, zero if there's no change. So supply shock, output, consumption, investment, hours worked, and wages all increase with a reduction in the interest rate and the price level. Probably like the best shock you could ask for, to be honest with you. Labor supply. Well, kind of similar to output, except there's one difference, and it's the wage rate. The wage rate under a labor supply shock falls, while the wage rate under a technology shock increases. So from right here, just between technology and labor supply, I can actually identify the differences. I can identify these two shocks uniquely because at least one thing is different. Now let's look at government spending. Well, that's radically different from the two previous shocks. But how different is it from the monetary policy shock? Well, according to the real business cycle model, the government spending shock is going to have no change on output. Consumption and investment are going to fall, or maybe one falls and the other doesn't, but in general, it's going to be both fall. No change in labor, no change in hours worked. The interest rate goes up and the price level goes up. So really, nobody ends up that much happier after a government spending shock except the government, I guess until the next election, but you know, elections aren't in the real business cycle model, so what's the point? Finally, monetary policy shock. The only thing that increases there is the price level of these endogenous variables that we're looking at. Real interest rate doesn't move, wages, hours work don't move, consumption, investment, and output don't move. So if we follow these shocks right here, or these responses to the shocks, then this is what the real business cycle model tells us we should be looking at. So how does it hold up? How does this model hold up when we're looking at real world data? Well, for that one, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to have to stay tuned for the next lecture. So thank you for watching and more will be coming soon. Bye.